Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 577. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 24th of February, 2020. All right, people, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clergy and laity alike, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. If you didn't get to watch last week's show, go in, tune in. It was a, a much better show than we thought it was going to be going in. But let's, let's discuss pre-show here. We sit down, we get all the cameras all lined up and make sure sound's working and we're not pixelated. And then we talk about what we're going to talk about. And like last week, we didn't know what we're going to talk about because uh, we get off on rabbit trails. And at some point I said, listen, I'm going to press the record button and let's see what happens. And all of a sudden the comments, best show ever. You guys know your stuff. I can't believe my life has changed. And I'm like, gosh, you guys don't understand. All we did was push the record button. We didn't know what we're talking about, but the Holy Spirit came through for us again. And we appreciate that. And we're expecting the same with this episode of 577. Before we get to the Holy Spirit doing its work, let's do what you need to do before we get started. That's like the episode, share the episode. We have a podcast. If you want to go to the show notes on YouTube, there's a link to the podcast. And after this episode, do what everybody else does, comment. We really appreciate it. We read all of them. And uh, it seems to be some type of symmetry going on because... Uh, you guys are commenting and other people's comments, and it's really fun to watch. Uh, you encourage and inform, and uh, you know, do what you do in comments. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. We are coming up two days away from Lent. Ash Wednesday is a uh, 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 somebody's beeping over there. One of you guys. Uh, Ash Wednesday Wednesday is this week, and uh, I was always told Lent is the most important season of the church that it's a time when the church and its people sit down and uh, repent, have a start over, have a do over. And in the news this week, I found myself discouraged. I was watching some uh, stories where people got involved with sexual issues, power issues, money issues, and had fallen, especially some leaders in the church. I'm following up on some news uh, some from GAFCON primates and uh, other leaders in the GAFCON movement in the Church of England, and I'm finding some failings and things that I find depressing. And I thought this is a great time to talk about the role of Lent in how we approach things that uh, encourage us and discourage us. But first, let's move on to some of the news. George, can you give us a brief on uh, some of those uh, stories of people failing? Well, of course, we've had more n corruption news from India, but I've been told I'm not allowed to talk about that. Yeah, That'll be our own. It, we're going to have our <laughs> own series, uh, Crooked Bishops <laughs> from India. And, of course, we're working on stories about Episcopal corruption Afri in Africa, in Tanzania, and in uh Zimbabwe and in South Africa, where bishops have been stealing, bishops have been being naughty. We had an Episcopal election overturned in Uganda by the National Church because of uh, hanky-panky. But the things that, that really I think are pressing for people in the Western world are for, Ang for evangelicals. Mm -hmm. The Telegraph had a news report that said Jonathan Fletcher, who has been stood down uh, had, by the Church of England, his permission to officiate has been withdrawn. Turns out he's still doing services. He did a committal at a funeral home, a crematorium, last week for a close friend, and he's still visiting churches where his friends are rectors. And the uh, there's been no consequence to his bad acts, and he just flouts the uh, the rules of the Church of England. It appears, to my reading, and the leaders of the evangelical word of the Church of England uh, close a blind eye to it. And at the same time, we have one of the most, we have, if you will, the male Mother Teresa, Jean Vanier, a French Canadian who founded La Arche Community, which is now spread around the world in 138 communities for developmentally disabled adults. Turns out he was a sexual predator and had some very strange, bizarre, and frankly, heretical ideas about sexuality. 
I'll let Gavin go into the details uh, of the, his understanding of the relationship between Jesus and Mary. But this is, for some people, Vanier being unmasked, he's dead, and La Arche did an internal, internal report, and they're to be commended for not trying to brush this off or hide this away. And they released the report on the 22nd of February into his misdeeds. And this is just a body blow to some people who looked at this man as a modern day saint. Justin Welby had this man come two, three years ago to the primates to tell them how to be good Christians. Now, poor Justin Welby, who has had a terrible problem with safeguarding his sexual abuse in the Church of England, chose a secret sexual abuser to come lecture the leaders of the Church of England on how to be good people. Oh. Well, Gavin, this is the, the news that I talk about as depressing. You know, not him. How could he fall? And I remember, must have been almost 25 years ago, watching an interview with uh, Franklin Graham. And he goes, I have a rule. Um, Billy, Billy Graham. Did I say Franklin? <gasps> Monday morning issues. Uh, Billy Graham says, I have a rule. And it's called the I will not be in a, wo uh, a room alone with a woman rule. And people are uh, teasing Vice President Pence for the same rule, but says, I always ask people to pray for two things for me. Pray that I'm never tempted by the flesh and that I'm never tempted by money. And every time we see a failing of a church leader, it's usually over those two issues. Uh, and it doesn't matter the denomination, uh, where they go to church or where they worship, it seems that money and uh, power and sex will always be a downfall for leaders in the church, Gavin. Yes, I, I, this is very difficult to talk about because it's it's both simple and, and complex. Um, I think it partly depends on what kind of picture of, a, of humanity we carry in our head. The, the danger is we carry a simplistic picture where someone's either a saint or they're a sinner. And so if you have someone like Jean Vanier, quite clearly as saint-like as you can get, he ticked all the boxes, uh, many of the boxes within Christianity and many of the boxes outside Christianity in terms of looking after the vulnerable and the disadvantaged. Um, I wasn't surprised to discover that he'd had six sexual encounters with women um, because I'm never surprised by people falling or failing. It seems to me that, I mean, and one could almost say that, that the more prominent someone is in Christianity, the more the devil will go after them. Now, this is not to pursue the old canard that it's not their fault, it's a devil's fault. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that we ought to be realistic and know that everyone is fragile, everyone is vulnerable, and we all have our weaknesses. It looks like Jean Vanier's were a, were, were a very strange weakness, whereby he invited women to have a consensual sexual relationship with him that sh stopped short of intercourse. Well, you know, this is kind of rather weird. So what you've got, you've got a picture of a, a man that still has certain moral values. He's just shifted the line an awfully long way, but, you know, he's kept one line, but, but, but shifted it. So he's not, he's not without moral values. The thing I found most difficult was not that he'd, he'd persuaded people into uh, illegitimate sexual intimacy, but that, that he had tried to persuade them that they were somehow reliving the relationship between Jesus and Mary. George, as we discussed this, said, well, which of the two Marys? And I said, it really doesn't matter. It's both it doesn't people. matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible. I, I, um, at, at this point, it takes me, uh, I mean, I worked in a university for 25 years, and I had people come and make informal confessions of, of, of the widest and most colorful nature. Um, I, I, I'm not shocked at the fragility of human beings, but I think, I think as we come to Lent, it's a reminder as we look at Jean Vanier, as we look at um, uh, Jonathan Fletcher, uh, and, and, as, and as we look at the heresy, I mean, the heresy of Jean Vanier, this Jesus and Mary thing, really, really caught me in my spiritual solar plexus. And I think the heresy of some of the churches that we we have been representing and criticizing catches our Lord in his solar plexus. They, they, in other words, it's easy to talk about sex, money, and power, 
but we should also talk about about heresy. And what what does all this mean? Well, we we could get terribly cast down and say, oh no, there goes another hero, or there there goes my I'm going to have to re reconfigure my 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 sense of Christian anthropology. Um, but actually, I think what we say is we're in a very serious spiritual battle that involves human beings who are caught between the animal and the angel. Uh, and sometimes they go up and sometimes they go down in their struggle. Uh, I, I think one of the things I want to do is to be completely free of the of the secular con condemnation, which says that once someone's done something bad, they can never be free of it. So, you know, if someone repents and says, look, I made a terrible mess of this, I I fell. Can I have can I can I can I have forgiveness? And the answer is, well, you may have to make reparation for people, but yes, you can be forgiven. So I think one of the things we, we want to do as Christians is say there is forgiveness, but there's also the constant need for spring cleaning and, and, and for self-examination. We, we ought to know what our weaknesses are, whether they're sex, money, power, or heresy, or, or something more exotic we haven't covered. Um, I mean, gossip is also a pretty nasty heresy. We come close to, to, to gossip ourselves here. We, we, we're aware of it and we try... And, and avoid it. But the, but here we are at Lent. And so what, what can Lent mean for us? Well, it means a time of, of renewed, renewed self-examination uh, and a time when we call out to the church with as much prophetic voice as we can borrow to say, you are never in a good shape. Uh, this is the time when you turn to the Lord and ask him to remake you. Um, are you engaging in self-examination? That's the first thing we say to, to ourselves and to the church. Are you engaging in self-examination? And now you have 40 days in which to begin to do something about it. Gavin, you mentioned last to show of, uh, of an incident where you had a talk with a woman priest who is now a bishop of the Church of England. Yeah. And this woman uh, thrived on vengeance. In other words, forgiveness was not part of a vocabulary. And she sought to extract revenge and vengeance in a in the spiritual realm and why i say this is you're absolutely right i mean we should not seek vengeance against jonathan smythe uh, uh, jonathan uh, fletcher jean vanier and all the abusers that have been uh, unamassed over these years we have the power to forgive them and and vengeance is mine saith the lord Justice is the Lord's, ours is the power to forgive. Because if we don't forgive these people, then we're going to be in their thrall uh, and we'll be in the, in the uh, power of the enemy because we've allowed this brokenness. That having been said, that doesn't mean that uh, we, c we should not see and act and have justice take place where Jonathan Fletcher is removed from a position of ministerial trust and responsibility if what has been said about him is true. I think I'd change the word justice to accountability. And one of the things yeah, I would want to say it. is I was watching uh, in French, which made it quite difficult, uh, a YouTube um, interview with a, uh, I think an ex-nun journalist and the leader of L'Arche in France. And I was hugely impressed at the way they were willing to be accountable. So the first thing they did when they discovered there was some smoke and they needed to check out whether there was some fire, was they delegated it to another organization. Uh, and they called in a, a, a professional organization that is skilled in this kind of thing. And then you look at the Church of England, and frankly, you think, well, they are a million miles away from this kind of integrity to pursue accountability, whether it's evangelical leaders or bishops. I, I, I have to say, one of the things that made me really, really, really upset <laughs> <laughs> I watched General Synod and I watched a measure about Jersey and the Channel Islands go through uh, the Synod. Now, as, as some of our listeners know, I was the Lord sent me to Jersey 10 weeks before this crisis broke and I broke around my ears and I, I, I tried to serve the church as best I can. But I know the truth about what happened. And when I heard three bishops lie through their teeth, totally... <laughs> in order to get this measure through Synod, I, my jaw hit the ground. I mean, I, 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 I may not have been overwhelmingly surprised at Jean Vanier committing sexual misdemeanors, but I can still be very surprised by three senior bishops telling outright 
blackguardly lies in public for the sake of the political agenda. Um, so accountability is very important. Full credit to Lush for the way they handled it. And, and as yet, in terms of what the Church of England should be doing about Fletcher. Uh, Gavin, lies is so much easier and more comforting. The, the bishops are consoling, the bishops who lied console themselves that they're offering gentle words that will allow this to go through without making things worse, of giving people what they want to hear. So I'm not trying to defend the lies, but I can see why they're lying. Because to tell the truth means to expose the hypocrisy and the incompetence of the leaders that led to this entire fiasco. Yeah, but the thing is, George, that doesn't wash with me at all. You know, I... <laughs> I am a sinner. I am flawed. I have fallen flat on my face. The only way I can continue in public as a Christian, uh, and it's sometimes rather difficult, is to say I have really screwed up. I have sinned. I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I ask for forgiveness, and I'll give it to anybody else because I've been given so much. We can't do that. That's a different narrative. There is no excuse. They're just we can't do Christianity like that. We 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 have to hold our hands up and be accountable and say I'm sorry, accept forgiveness, give forgiveness, and start again. And that that includes all the way up in institution. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Uh, Justin Welby, Michael Curry, Barack Obama, uh, Bill Clinton have gone on worldwide apology tours. Justin Welby apologized to General Synod for being a white. Etonian, well-educated, oh. privileged. He's apologized to the Indians of, for the Amritsar massacre of 1920. Barack Obama has apologized to the West Africans for the slave trade and so on and so on and so forth. People apologizing for things that are not of their own doing, but then refusing to take ownership of the sins and the crime, to take a, be accountable for what they have done. They apologize for others. What's, what's the difference? I mean, uh, why is that such a bad thing to have Justin Welby apologize for being a straight white man with an old Etonian tie? Well, because the, 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 he... <laughs> I mustn't dribble and become <laughs> apathetic. <laughs> no, you don't drool. Dribbling's fine. <laughs> uh, I think what was so sad to see Justin Welby apologizing for being a white man with a private education was that he was placating the false gods. Thou shalt have no other god before me, says the Lord. And so General Sinot had introduced a whole series of false gods, uh, rapacious deities who wanted respect paid in terms of the misdistribution of power. You, you don't find anything of that in, in the Decalogue or in the Gospels. Um, and Justin Welby was talking a different religion. There were things he had to apologize for. He he could have, there were, there were three or four apologies he could make over the Jersey issue. Uh, he, he might have wanted to apologize for the fact he was presiding over three of his colleagues telling mendacious lies and knew it and said nothing. Uh, he, he, he might have wanted to con continue apologizing uh, for, for not holding people to account in public office that he should have done. But, but, but to apologize for being a privileged white man who went at a private education. This is this is idolatry, and and, and you know it's not Christianity. It's and they we were talking earlier on about why the Holy Spirit seemed to be with some people and not with others, or in some places not with others. And we agree we didn't really know, but there are some things we do know, and that is if if you if you swap gods, <laughs> you 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 begin to invoke a different spirit and in the General Synod in the Church of England, we saw the Archbishop swapping gods and therefore, I think, invoking a different spirit. If you, uh, I'm sorry, Kevin, I, I was just going to say that, uh, uh, that this is the sort of behavior that alienates the man in the white van in the UK. Uh, people can, people, the, the common person, the average person can sniff out and smell hypocrisy. They know what mendacious lying is taking place. And so they have the archbishop apologize for being privileged. They know he's not going to do anything to change that or about that. And Gavin, you shared a very sad incident about the changing nature of England, where the church is absent, what fills its spot? Well, again, I'm sorry to be 
I'm sorry to be sad, but I suppose if, if again, if it helps us get on our knees on, on on Ash Wednesday, then maybe some good will come of it. It was just a small news item uh, in in the Lake District, which is a, a lovely and beautiful national park. Uh, there is a Wesleyan Chapel. It's been closed now for ten years, uh, and there was news that someone wanted to buy it and to open it up as a as a religious center. So this 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 could be good. Um, it turns out it's the Muslims. And then when they were asked why they wanted to buy a, a Wesleyan chapel and turn it into a mosque in a place where there were no Muslims for 100 miles, the answer was, well, we, we, we're planning to deal with um, Muslim holiday traffic. Now, from an Islamic point of view, I can see why you'd want to do that. But from an English point of view, it's, it, it's, it's death. It's the death knell. Here is... Um, here is a beautiful English church and there's no money or commitment or people and it's going to be a mosque. And this is this is rule 101 in English society. If you turn your back on Jesus, you'll get Mohammed. There the, the may be four or five or ten years between the collapse of Christianity, the, the absence of commitment to Jesus um, amongst the church and the surrounding community. But it will be filled, the vacuum will be filled by Islam and by Mohammed. And that's that's what this mosque represents. It's very, so you're, very you're, sad. you're saying there's no Christian holiday traffic? Apparently not. So when I look back on uh, Christian history, I always ask myself: Is in my own history, is this redeemable, or is it damnable? You know, and I only find things can be redeemable. The bad things that we do. Thing, bad things we think, the bad things of of our, our Christian history is through repentance, uh, through a time of Lent, through a time of reflection, uh, to say we screwed up, we're sorry, we're going to start again. I don't see this in terms that Justin Welby does on an institutional level, apologizing for being white, apologizing for being born in Britain, apologizing for, you know, all the things he apologized for. I think it's more of a individual time that we spend in Lent and we have our 40 days. And we each have different responsibilities. There's some good news. I read a few months ago of a retired clergyman who came into an inheritance of half a million pounds and he immediately went round Wales buying up old churches uh, for 10, 15,000 pounds each. And this was lovely. And he's saying he's waiting for the revival. So when the revival comes, they will be owned by Christians and, and, and ready to go. <laughs> and that's completely wonderful. So let's set that alongside the Muslims buying closed Methodist chapels in the Lake District. But he's still going to need people to get on their knees in those churches. And at the moment, we're short of people willing to get on their knees. I, I, more and more, I think, um, I, 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 I've got this sus suspicion and... Um, it's not, it's not overtly, I can't find a Bible verse for it, so our more evangelical customers will have to forgive me yet again. But, but, but when, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, we face a, a fire that burns away the wood and the stone, leaving only what silver and gold there is left, I do wonder whether the worth of my life will have been in the length of time I spent say, saying the Sanctus. Uh, whenever I find myself saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of his glory, I think I'm doing what a human being was born to do. <laughs> and, and that's one of the reasons why we go to church. We, we go to church to make the air vibrate with praise, because it's what we were born to do. <laughs> it's what the angels are, are, are supposed to do. And here we are stuck between animal and angel. And the closer we get to the angel by saying the Sanctus, the more we come into our inheritance. And that's why there are churches, holy spaces to be filled with praise. And the less we do that, the more likely we are to slip into the animal, like poor Jean Manier found himself uh, tugged. So we're all in the middle somewhere. And in, in this Lent, we, we need to head closer to Sanctus than to love, money, power, or lying. You think we covered everything? How about we do a couple of comments that we like? Great. You just prepare for comments. <laughs> I, 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 can, a couple. I, yeah. I would like to say thank you to the Christian psychiatrist who sent me the most astonishing account of a woman possessed by the spirit of Lilith in a psychiatric unit, uh, and, and said to me, "You know, it's out, that stuff's real and it's out there." <laughs> and so thank I, you for the corroboration. I would like to thank the Church of Scientology International 
for adding me this morning <laughs> to their news release service. So talking about spiritual warfare on Friday means I'm on the Scientologist radar on Monday morning. And I, I, this is true. They did. I, I forwarded it to Gavin and Kevin, the yeah. first of the news missives from them. I, I'm really so glad that they didn't catch me on their radar too, George. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one of my favorite ones. Um, it's uh, from Pete, probably not Pete from North London. Uh, Kevin, <laughs> the red title banner for this episode has the wrong date. Otherwise, an excellent and very relevant discussion. Yes, sometimes Kevin makes typos and editorial issues with the, uh, the Photoshop, and I fixed it and uploaded it. But we have lots of wonderful people who really uh, understand the nature of what we're talking about, not just the substance. And last week we talked about, you know, spiritual warfare. I was expecting some uh, people to be, you know, uneasy about that. Nobody was. They understand that this really is a spiritual war that's going on within the church. And, you know, as we're reporting this week, some of the big people that we thought were saints in the past are falling. I think we should mention that Francis McNutt just died recently, and many American viewers will know who of whom I speak. He, Francis McNutt was a Catholic priest who was one of the leaders of the charismatic renewal movement in Catholicism. He left the Catholic Church to marry and became an Episcopalian in the 1970s and, has run, and ran with his wife Judith Christian Healing Ministries out of Jacksonville and Deliverance Ministry was a major function. And I believe McNutt reconciled with the Catholic Church before his death. I don't know this for certain. Um, but the deliverance ministry was a major gift that McNutt brought into the lexicon of American Christianity. And I, I want to echo what Gavin has said, that this stuff is real. Uh, it's not the possession of movies or old fashioned, cranky, scary people. But, you know, the, the, we are engaged in the spiritual warfare that is constant and ongoing. And I, had a wonderful, I had a wonderful Catholic uh, exorcist priest friend, a man called Father John Abberton. Uh, I, I, learned most, I, I learned most of my experiences, deliverance from him over the last 20 years as we were involved in a renewal movement called True Life in God. And when I began, I was, I, I was at the height of my liberal Jungian period, and I remember uh, the Lord was very kind. He, he introduced me very slowly back into the realities of, of this. The reason I'm telling the story is, as we come to Lent, John was very keen on Christians uh, um, uh, self-delivering, <laughs> and he would say to people that, that they had to keep very um, short accounts with the Lord. Uh, and he said, when you when you go to the Eucharist, he said. Uh, you, you can engage in your own deliverance ministry. As, as you take the host, he said, say in your heart, Jesus in, Satan out. <laughs> and he said, you will greatly upset any, any demonic influence that you have uh, in any way accumulated. And the fact is that, that I do very much believe, because I've seen it, that the, that, that, that the enemy creeps under the side of our tent without our seeing very often. And I, th I thought for, for those who are interested in, in uh, spiritual warfare, uh, I, I commend Father John Abbotton's advice when you go to the Eucharist in Lent. Jesus in, Satan out. And never underestimate the power of repeating the baptismal vows. Cool. So we're not suggesting anybody give up unscripted for Lent, right? <laughs> no, I just want to... <laughs> watch, watch it twice as a penance. <laughs> watch it twice as much. <laughs> Indeed. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Kevin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 577 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless you for your patience and a happy and an effective event.